So, so start with a simply connected domain D which is not the whole complex plane ok. Start with the simply connected domain D which is not the whole complex plane and uh, so choose uh, choose uh, an A which is in the complement of D ok. So, D is uh, uh, D is not the whole complex plane and uh, it is simply connected and the Riemann mapping theorem uh, is the statement that D is holomorphically isomorphic to the unit disc ok and in fact you can find uh, such a holomorphic isomorphism which carries any fixed point of D to the origin and that uh, such an isomorphism is unique provided you fix the derivative uh, of that map at the or at that point which is being mapped to the origin ok. So, now uh, let me recall something that we already did you choose an point which is outside D ok. Uh, let uh, 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 so, so uh, f of z uh, so let me not write f of z. So, z minus a uh, is uh, is non vanishing on on D because A is not in D and it is analytic ok and if you have a nowhere vanishing analytic function on a simply connected domain you can find a branch of the analytic branch of the logarithm. Uh, so, uh, has an analytic branch uh, uh, of uh, log so, so so, D has an analytic branch of log of z minus a using which we define an analytic branch of square root of z minus a on D ok. After all uh, uh, root of z minus a is just uh, e to the half log z minus a. So, if you use analytic branch of log of z minus a then e to the half log z minus a is also analytic and that is a analytic branch of root z minus a ok. And uh, we have seen we have seen uh, that uh, uh, this function this root of analytic branch of root of z minus a which I am simply writing as root of z minus a is actually 1 to 1 is uh, is injective and uh, uh, so you know if you call this as h of z ok and h of d uh, does not intersect minus h of d ok. So, these are all things that we saw a uh, few lectures ago. Uh, the image of D under H and minus H these images will be distinct ok. So, there is no intersection between H D and minus H D and in fact uh, uh, and you know it is not not very difficult to recall the proof you see if if Z 1 uh, H of Z 1 is equal to H of Z 2 will imply that you know uh, Z 1 which is H of uh, Z 1 squared plus a will be h of z2 squared plus a which will be z2. So, this will tell you that uh, so this implies h is 1 1 ok uh, and h is of course injective 
uh, I mean H is of course holomorphic and you know hinge T holomorphic map is always a uh, isomorphism onto its image because of the uh, inverse mapping theorem right therefore it is a injective holomorphic map so it is a isomorph holomorphic isomorphism onto its image and so this is the fact that h is 1 to 1 okay that is injective then uhhh uh, so uh, h from d to h of d uh, is a holomorphic isomorphism isomorphism by inverse mapping theorem or um, yeah inverse function theorem or inverse mapping theorem okay and uh, the other fact is that uh, there is no there is no point in hd and minus hd and the, the reason is uh, again uh, the same kind of calculation uh, if uh, if w not uh, belongs to hd and minus hd then w not is actually h of z1 and it is also equal to minus h of z2 where z1 and z2 are in d remember that minus h is actually the other branch of the square root h is one branch of the square root of z minus a and minus h is after all the other branch of the square root and all I am trying to say is that two branches of the square root are different okay because every number different from 0 has two distinct square roots that is that is all that I am saying. So you know I mean that is the that is essentially the uh, uh, reason for all this. So you know so if you use this again you will get you will get z1 is equal to h of z1 squared plus a uh, and that is equal to h of z1 uh, uh, I mean sorry h squared of z1 is the same as h squared of z2. So it will be equal to h squared of z2 plus a which is z2 okay and this will tell you that uh, 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 it will give you this funny thing that you know h of uh, uh, z1 is equal to minus h of z1 and that will tell you that h of z1 is 0 and uh, that is a contradiction because you see uh, h is after all an exponential h is h of z is root square root of z minus a is e to the something alright and you know the exponential function can never take the value 0. So this is this is not possible as uh, h is e to the half uh, log z minus a okay therefore this contradiction tells you that there is no point in common with h of d and h of minus d all right so you know uh, so you know the uh, so that the so the diagram is that you have this uh, uh, this is uh, uh, well uh, I will not draw uh, so this is t simply connected domain and I have this map h then you see uh, if you draw so I will I'll draw d bounded but it need not be bounded okay uh, just because a domain is uh, holomorphically isomorphic to the unit disc does not mean that it is bounded because you should remember that the unit disc is uh, uh, holomorphically isomorphic to any half plane and no half plane is bounded okay. So uh, you should not expect a simply connected domain. Uh, which is uh, uh, I mean a domain which is holomorphically isomorphic to the unit disc do not expect it to be bounded okay that is the only mistake one makes but it will be bounded if you consider it as a domain in the extended Riemann uh, plane okay in the extended complex plane namely on the Riemann sphere the upper half plane will also look like a disc okay. So it will be bounded in the external in the extended complex plane okay uh, but not on the complex plane right. So anyway I am drawing d to be bounded just so that you know it is easier to draw and then so you know the picture is like this so you have so you have h of d uh, and and then you know you have you have h of minus d which is just its reflection I think it is a pr pretty bad picture. Uh.
so this is minus h of d and they do not they do not intersect all right this is the situation and now what you do is you know you take a point z0 here and then you take uh, a point w0 there okay and choose a small enough disc surrounding w0 okay. So choose uh, choose uh, uh, rho so that uh, you know mod w0 uh, so mod so that mod w minus w0 less than rho less than rho uh, is in h of d mind you d from uh, I mean h from d to h of d is a is a holomorphic isomorphism because h is injective holomorphic and a injective holomorphic map is a holomorphic isomorphism okay. So h is a holomorphic isomorphism of d to h d okay and I am taking a point w0 in h d which is the image of a point z0 in d under h and I am taking this small disc closed disc centered at w0 which is inside h d okay. Then, then you see you then what you will get is you know if I take this I mean if I take small enough disc uh, 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 small enough disc, disc if I take uh, centered at w0 okay with radius epsilon then what will happen is that uh, mod hz plus w0 will always be greater than epsilon for all z in d this happens because you see the distance of hz from w0 I mean this is actually distance of hz this is the distance of minus h hz from w0 this quantity is distance of minus of h of z from w0 because the, that distance is modulus of minus hz minus w0 which is the same as modulus of hz plus w0 okay and but you know minus h is disjoint from this. So if you take minus if you take any z here okay then h z will lie here so you know minus h z will lie will it be its reflection it will be in minus h d and certainly therefore the distance of minus h z from w0 will be certainly greater than this epsilon okay that is that is all I have written but now this is what I am one can use to produce a holomorphic mapping of the domain into a subdomain of the unit disc. So what you do is you put h1 of z to be equal to epsilon by h z plus w0 look at this map this is a map from d to the unit disc why because mod h1z is mod of this and mod of this is less than 1 because of this inequality and mind you uh, h1 is of course uh, injective why because you see h is injective and hz plus w0 is injective inversion is a mobius transformation that is injective okay and then multiplying by epsilon is also a mobius transformation so I am getting h1 from h by applying a series of Mobius transformations. So I first take h I translate by w0 that is a Mobius transformation to get hz plus w0 then I apply inversion is zeta going to 1 by zeta that is also a Mobius transformation okay and then I multiply by epsilon multiplying by a constant is also a Mobius transformation therefore I get h1 from h by applying a series of Mobius transformations therefore h is injective therefore h1 is also injective. So h1 is an h1 is injective and holomorphic therefore again by the inverse mapping theorem h1 will give an isomorphism of d onto h of d which will now be a subdomain of delta okay and it will be of course simply connected because uh, uh, all uh, all holomorphic isomorphisms are also homeomorphisms and a homeomorphic image of simply connected space is again a simply connected space okay. So h1 is injective and holomorphic so so h1 from d to h of d h1 of d inside delta is a holomorphic isomorphism uh, onto 
the subdomain uh, uh, H1 of D of delta which uh, uh, which is of course simply connected. And you know now uh, so we have uh, I mean using all this somehow we are able to map this D into the into a subdomain of the unit disc okay ah sorry this should be epsilon you are right yeah so first I wrote uh, mod w minus w not less than rho but then I changed the rho to epsilon so this should be epsilon okay so epsilon sufficiently small so you know finally we have managed to map D into a yeah, simply into a on to isomorphically onto holomorphically isomorphically holomorphically isomorphic onto a subdomain of the unit disc but what you want is you want a map that whose image is the whole unit disc okay plus you also want the map with the property that it uh, takes a given point let us say z0 to the origin okay and you also want the derivative to be uh, some fixed the derivative at z0 you want also have the map such that the derivative at z0 is some fixed positive real number okay so these are the things that we want so uh, we want to find uh, a holomorphic map holomorphic isomorphism f from d to delta with f of z0 equal to 0 f dash of z0 is equal to lambda which is a positive real number okay you want to find a, uh, a holomorphic isomorphism like this okay and uh, we have already seen that such a holomorphic isomorphism is unique okay such an f we have already seen seen that such an f is is unique okay the holomorphic map of the simply connected domain which is not the whole complex plane onto the unit disc can be made unique if you specify its its value at one point and the derivative at that point so what we do is we fix a point if you fix a point z0 in the domain and specify that the value of the function at z0 which we usually take as 0 and you specify the derivative uh, at that point z0 and usually you you take the you if, if you want you can take it one you can make the derivative one if you want right for that matter you could make it any any real number right uh, so if you want you can make it one right then such an f is unique because you know if you have two such f's f1 and f2 then if you compose uh, uh, if you have two f1 and if I, if you have two such maps maps f which satisfy these conditions then if you compose uh, f1 inverse and then followed by f2 you will get an automorphism of delta okay which will take 0 to 0 okay and whose derivative uh, whose derivative uh, you, you will see that uh, uh, you, you will get an automorphism of delta and this derivative condition will tell you that it has to be uh, just the identity automorphism and that will tell you that f1 equal to f2 okay this is something that we have already seen so such an f is unique with that something that we have already seen because you know we we already know how the automorphisms of uh, delta look like right so so i have to find this f so you know now what we do is uh, uh, we completely change our viewpoint okay we you don't try to get this f uh, directly okay what you do is you look at all possible holomorphic maps into the unit disc okay and which take uh, uh, which are injective okay you look at all possible maps like this which map d uh, into a subdomain of the unit disc okay and which are injective plus you also add the condition that z0 goes to, goes to 0 okay you can add, so you look at that family and then up essentially apply montel's theorem to that family cleverly okay and then you will get uh, this f as an extremal function okay 
So now we change the viewpoint. So what we'll do is let script f. So here is the family. So here is where I try to bring in something on which I can apply Montel's theorem. Okay. So let script f be the set of all h. Uh, so let me use small f. I hope I have not used small f anywhere. Yeah, so set of all small f from uh, d to delta such that f is analytic injective and f of uh, z0 equal to 0. You look at you look at this family, look at all uh, mappings of the simply connected domain D into the unit disc which are injective and which take z0 to 0. See this family is non empty the reason is because see h I already I have already constructed a injective holomorphic map from D into the unit disc but I can adjust it so that I can make z0 go to 0 okay. So uh, uh, f is non empty uh, see if you put uh, uh, f uh, let me put f0 to be you know you put f0 of z to be some uh, uh, you know let me use uh, delta times uh, h1 of z minus h1 of z0 for delta small okay see h1 so I have this h1 okay which maps d into the unit disc all right and it is injective now what you do is you define f0 to be delta times h1z minus h1z0 you know why I am putting this h1z minus h1z0 that is because if I plug in z equal to z0 this will become 0 so it will map z0 to 0 because that is a condition for functions in f but the other thing is I want this uh, uh, this function also to go into the unit disc and uh, for that it is enough to take delta I think uh, I think it is enough to take uh, uh, just enough to take delta less than half probably see mod mod f0 so then uh, see uh, uh, I, I do not have to take a delta very small probably you see because f0 of z0 is 0 okay and f0 is of course uh, f0 is injective analytic it is injective analytic because you know h1 is injective so h1 minus a constant is injective and epsilon I mean some constant multiplied by an injective function is also an injective function so long as that constant is not 0 all right therefore it is an injective analytic function there is no problem about that and the only thing you have to worry about is whether it takes values in the unit disc so you know if you calculate mod f0 of z0 if z you know by triangle inequality this will be less than or equal to mod delta into uh, modulus of this minus this which is equal to modulus of this plus modulus of this which is 2 okay because h1 takes values in the unit disc so any value of h1 has modulus less than 1 so triangle inequality will give this so if you choose delta less than half I mean less than half then you are done so this implies uh, f0 is in your family f if delta is less than half because if delta is strictly less than half then mod f0 is strictly less than 1 which means that f0 lands in inside the unit disc and that means f0 is in this in this family script f. So therefore this family is non empty I have a non empty family and now comes the now you know the whole purpose of defining this family is because uh, you know Monte for Montel's applying Montel's theorem your family should be a family of analytic functions which are uniformly bounded that is the only condition you want okay the point is this is automatically uniformly bounded because you see they are all functions here into the unit disc therefore modulus of the functions are always bounded by 1 okay whenever you consider a family of analytic functions taking values in a bounded domain okay it is automatically uniformly bounded so the script f is automatically uniformly bounded that is the whole point okay and you can apply Montel's theorem okay. Uh, for all functions small f in script f mod f is less than or equal to 1 implies the script f is uniformly bound okay 
in fact i uh, in the in 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 montel's theorem i need only uniformly bounded on compact subsets i need only uniformly bounded on compact subsets but here i'm getting uniformly bounded throughout okay and uh, that's because the target domain is a bounded domain okay and uh, so you know if i uh, so the moral of the story is that uh, a montel's theorem applies and you give me any sequence of functions in script f okay there will always be a subsequence which converges uniformly on compact subsets of t okay so montel's theorem applies and given any sequence fn in f there exists a subsequence f and k uh, uh, which converges uniformly on compact subsets of D. I have to keep saying compact subsets of D because I do not know D is bounded, D need not be bounded okay. Uh, a domain that is uh, holomorphically isomorphic to the unit disc need not be bounded for example it could be the a half plane which is not bounded okay so whenever you are working with an unbounded domain all these uniform convergence etc you should only expect on compact subsets okay so now so the question is to which sequence am i going to apply this my question is to which sequence am i going to apply it so you know the, what i'm going to do is i'm going to take so look at at uh, uh, the set of all uh, derivatives at z0 and their model i for f in small f in the family f look at this set so i am taking all these functions these functions are all uh, holomorphic maps that map z0 to the origin and they map d holomorphically onto a simply connected subdomain of the unit disk i am looking at all their derivatives at the origin at, at, at z0 at that fixed point z0 okay. Uh, what you must understand is that uh, you know we have already seen during the course of the proof of Montel's theorem that you know uh, if you look at a family uh, if you look at a uniformly bounded family of analytic functions okay then and you take a point in the domain then you know in a sufficiently small neighborhood of that point all or even at that point at that given point the derivatives are all uniformly bounded because of Cauchy's estimate okay. So you know so uh, uh, note that uh, if uh, mod z minus z naught is equal to rho uh, less than or equal to rho is in D okay then uh, mod f dash of z0 is going to be I am I'm just repeating what I wrote I am just applying Cauchy's integral formula and this is less than or equal to uh, uh, 1 by rho okay where th that is because mod f is always less than or equal to 1 okay. So normally when you apply this Cauchy's estimate what you will get is you will get m by the you will get the bound for the derivative at the center of the circle to be equal to m by the radius of the circle okay where m is the maximum uh, it is a bound for the mod of the function on the circle and of course the bound on the circle will also be a bound inside the circle because of the maximum principle okay so it will be a uniform bound but for the functions f in f in for the function small f in script f the bound is 1 so I will get this. 
but what does this tell you this tells you that uh, this will tell you that this set is bounded above this is for all this is for all f in script f this is true for all script f in script f oh sorry yeah this is that is right there is a square in the denominator but you will get only a row there yeah thank you yeah that is correct because you if you look at nth derivative you should get zeta minus z0 to the n plus 1 okay. So, if you look at first derivative it is zeta minus z0 to the square that is correct that is right. So, uh, so you get this but now uh, so what this tells you this implies that if you take supremum of this of all this uh, derivatives at z0 where small f is in script f this is if you call this as a this is finite because you know this is a set of uh, non negative real numbers it is bounded above by this 1 by rho okay and uh, uh, therefore it is uh, therefore this uh, uh, the supremum exists and it is finite all right and of course you know uh, 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 the point is that the same row works for all f okay. So, all the derivatives at z0 are uniformly bounded the family of derivatives uh, uh, of functions in f all those derivatives are uniformly bounded at z0 okay and therefore this this a is a finite quantity the supremum is a finite quantity I said that I mean so this is uh, standard property of the subsets of the real line no that if you have a subset of the real line which is bounded above uh, then it has a supremum okay and that is equivalent to actually the completeness of the real line okay. So, so this a is finite all right and now uh, you also notice that uh, so, so one of the things that I want to tell you is that uh, uh, see this <coughs> you see this a is uh, uh, so the thing I want to say is that this a is positive okay I want to say that a is positive okay that is one fact that is one fact this a is a positive number that is something that I want to say and uh, uh, and that is because you see uh, uh, so the claim the claim I want to say is that a is positive and I think that is more or less clear because you know uh, uh, if a is 0 then uh, the supremum of all this is, these are all non negative numbers if the supremum is 0 then each is 0 okay then all these derivatives at z0 have to vanish right because each of these numbers is less than or equal to the supremum is supposed to be uh, an upper bound it is the least upper bound. So, each mod f dash of z0 is greater than or equal to 0 and it is less than or equal to a. So, if a is 0 then all the derivatives at z0 vanish and that that is not that is not possible that is because you know all the see all the f's I am considering they are all injective okay for an injective you know an injective analytic function is an isomorphism onto its image. So, derivative cannot vanish okay derivative cannot vanish because there is an inverse function. So, the just the injectivity of all these f's will force that you know a cannot be 0 a has to be positive since uh, f uh, each since any f in script f is uh, 1 1 okay. So, a is a positive number a cannot be 0 all right. So, a is some positive number and now you know I am going uh, let me go back to your good old uh, real analysis where you know the supremum has a uh, has a approximating property. So, the supremum of a set of numbers is can be obtained as the accumulation point of that set of numbers okay. In other words what is the property of supremum it is the supremum is called the least upper bound. So, it is an upper bound and any number less than that is not an upper bound okay. So, which means that you take any number less than that you can find a member of this set which exceeds that and that number less than that you take it could be epsilon less than that and in this way you can cook up uh, a sequence of elements from this set which tends to a okay and it is that sequence of f that to which I am going to apply Montel's theorem okay. So, uh, we can 
we can find f n such that f n inside script f such that f n dash of z naught more in modulus tends to you can do this because of the approximation property of the supremum that is because the supremum uh, is a is an accumulation point okay and I can uh, therefore get a sequence of elements here which tends to the supremum and that sequence uh, corresponds will give rise to a sequence that will correspond to a sequence of functions applied to the point z0 whose derivatives are applied to the point z0 and that is the sequence I want that is the sequence to which I am going to apply Montel's theorem okay now apply Montel's theorem by Montel's theorem uh, f n converges to a function uh, uh, f okay my claim is that this is my function okay uh, probably uh, maybe I may have to modify it so let me call it as uh, f0 so by Montel's theorem so what is Montel's theorem uh, it tells you that whenever you have a family of analytic functions which is uh, uh, which is uniformly bounded on compact subsets then uh, given any sequence in the in this collection there is always a subsequence which will converge uniformly on compact subsets. So it means there is a uh, I will find a subsequence f n k of uh, f n which converges uniformly on compact subsets so basically it converges to a function that function will be analytic and the analyticity is because the convergence is uniform on compact subsets okay. So uh, you know that uh, if you have a uniform limit of uh, analytic functions it is analytic okay and uh, more generally if you do not have uniform limit on the whole domain if you have uniform limit only on compact subsets that is enough because uh, that allows you to check within a closed disk which is compact okay. So uh, uniform limit of uh, a normal limit of analytic functions is analytic okay. So this f0 is analytic clearly you see clearly you can see that uh, f0 mod f0 is less than or equal to 1 because each of the functions here uh, uh, are into the unit disk the limit function will also be into the unit disk okay and uh, uh, the derivative of f0 at z0 will be this a okay because you know under normal convergence not only uh, does the sequence of functions converge to a given function which is analytic the derivatives will converge to the derivative of the limit function and this will happen for any nth derivative <coughs> okay because normal convergence is a very powerful thing right therefore what will happen is this converges to this so its derivative will converge to its derivative but its derivative at z0 converges to a so its derivative at <coughs> z0 is a okay. So you know what we have uh, so more or less what we have done is we have found a function which is uh, mapping into the unit disk because mod f0 is less than or equal to 1 but mind you if it is less than or equal to 1 <coughs> it is not exactly into the unit disk it is into the closed unit disk it is a function which maps into the closed unit disk and so fine so I have this function which maps uh, the domain D into delta bar okay because the uh, uh, see each for each each function uh, you know uh, uh, in fact each function maps <coughs> into the unit disk okay in fact there is strict inequality here all right and uh, uh, therefore here also I will have strict inequality all right but here I cannot claim the limit I cannot probably claim strict inequality all right um, but more or less I will get strict inequality simply because of the open mapping theorem okay uh, anyway but let it be as it is let me not worry about it the first thing I want to fix is that you know I want to say this f0 is uh, I want to say this first of all I want to say this f0 is a uh, 
a non constant function it is a non constant analytic function and I want to say f0 is also injective. Now why is f0 non constant because its derivative is uh, at, at z0 is non zero a is a is positive. So this implies that f0 is non constant. and now comes another beautiful thing see the fact that f0 is injective comes from Hurwitz's theorem okay see Hurwitz's theorem there is one version of Hurwitz's theorem which says that you know if you have a sequence of analytic functions which are u which are univariant which are injective if that sequence converges normally okay then the limit function is either constant or it is again injective okay it the original Hurwitz's theorem uh, the uh, standard version of the Hurwitz theorem will say that you know if you have a sequence of analytic functions converging normally <coughs> to a given to a, to a certain function then that if you take a 0 of that limit function of multiplicity m then you know the zeros uh, for beyond a certain stage all the sequence of uh, in, the, in the sequence of analytic functions that you are considering beyond a certain stage all the functions in your sequence will have zeros of the total number of zeros in a small neighborhood of the zero of the limit function of multiplicity m will be again multiplicity m that is what the Hurwitz theorem will say it will say that if the limit function has zero of uh, it has a zero of order m at z0 then beyond a certain stage all the functions in the sequence will also have m zeros in a neighborhood of z0 sufficiently small neighborhood of z0 and all these zeros will accumulate at the 0 of the limit function and that is the original version of the Hurwitz theorem <coughs> but another version of the Hurwitz theorem is if you apply this original version carefully uh, you get the other version of the Hurwitz theorem which says that if you have a, a sequence of univalent that is injective analytic functions okay if it converges normally to a limit function then the either the limit function is constant and if it is not constant the limit function continues to be injective I mean the injectivity is just the fact that <coughs> it, it is just the fact that it takes every value once so the multiplicity is 1 so basically Hurwitz theorem says that multiplicities will be preserved <coughs> okay the multiplicity will be preserved so if all the functions in the sequence are injective they are their multiplicities are all 1 okay therefore the limit function will also have multiplicity 1 if it is not constant okay that is Hurwitz theorem so if you apply it here you see f <coughs> this f0 is a actually uniform limit uh, it is a normal limit of these functions and these functions are all injective okay that and the limit function is not is, is, is non constant therefore by Hurwitz's theorem f0 is injective okay so by Hurwitz's theorem f0 is injective okay now you know uh, uh, we are <coughs> we are more or less done we are more or less done okay and uh, uh, you see the, the there is only one more claim left and the claim is the following that the image of f0 is the whole unit disc <coughs> okay so this is the final claim see you know f0 is a non constant analytic function <coughs> and it is injective so it is a holomorphic isomorphism so it is a holomorphic isomorphism of d into the closed unit disc alright but the image has to be open because the image of a holomorphic map is open so it is an open set inside the closed unit disc okay and the claim is that open set is the open unit disc in other words f0 achieves the job of mapping the given simply connected domain which is not the whole complex plane onto the whole unit disc and proves the Riemann mapping there okay and then of course the derivative at z0 if I want it to be 1 I have it as a so if you take instead of f0 if you take 1 by a times f0 that will have derivative 1 so you can always adjust the derivative to be 1 at z0 that is not a big deal the big deal is to sh show that this f0 fills out the the image fills out the whole unit disc open unit disc okay and here is where the big deal comes the big deal comes from hyperbolic geometry on the unit disc 
that is what helps us to ensure that uh, this F0 has to fill out the whole unit disc okay. and that is because this F0 is an extremal function it is it is extremal because you know it achieves this limit. So, whenever you have a family of functions and you know if you look at uh, you look at some numbers defined based on that family okay and you take a limit okay then if you are able to find a function in that family which uh, achieves this number it is called an extremal function okay. So, I am able to find a member of f script f okay namely f0 f0 is a member of script f such that the uh, uh, the derivative at z0 is exactly this extremal value this limiting value which is a supremum mind you a supremum is also a limit okay. So, and the point is because of this extreme uh, extremal property of f0 it has to fill the whole unit disc that is the and that is where hyperbolic geometry comes. So, hyperbolic geometry comes in to actually tell you that the uh, the the uh, image of f0 is exactly the unit disc. So, so let me write that uh, f0 <coughs> hence Who's Riemann mapping theorem? The claim uses, uh, or rather, the proof of the claim uses hyperbolic geometry. So let me stop here.